whatever spice he wants to this too. Why not? So I would say to help influence and support features, yes. Um, but there's certainly limits to that. And so just for, for those that aren't familiar with this model, um, this is uh, uh, Fedora's, Fedora's a very community centric model for those that are familiar with that. And so uh, when we talk about community uh, control, like the community has quite a bit of control over Fedora. Uh, and I'm only drawing that parallel to, to contrast it with CentOS Stream. And so, for example, uh, the Fedora community recently decided they wanted to ship and support ButterFS as a default file system. That is not something that we're looking at on the RHEL side, as, as far as I know. And so, uh, you know, that's an example where they, you know, they, they've made it a decision that uh, uh, you know, they feels best for their community. On the CentOS Stream side, um, all of the decisions that go into the mainline uh, branch, and that, that's important, uh, will be made by Red Hatters who are basically agreeing to support said feature. And so while uh, you can definitely influence uh, features that get in, uh, at the end of the day, the influence only goes so far because uh, there is definitely going to be a Red Hatter who actually has to make the decision to merge the pull request. And keep in mind that when they do that, um, you know, implicit in that is a, is a contract that says, I will support this feature for the next 13 years, so help me. Uh, and so, uh, and so that's, uh, you know, that's, that's just an example of kind of the stuff we're dealing with. Uh, Neil, for those of you that don't know, uh, uh, got first place. He is one of the first people that has actually submitted a pull request to CentOS Stream that is now headed, destined for REL. And, uh, you know, you, uh, uh, others can do the same. So that's, uh, that's my answer. I'm so glad. So Mike, for the, uh, uh, so, okay, so now I understand um, if I'm a community person and I want to, so in Fedora, we added support for, or we now default to ButterFS. What if, uh, for whatever reason, um, I feel like I want RHEL, but I want RHEL with ButterFS as the default file system. What are my options? How could I do something like that in stream? Debian. Is that, no, I'm, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's a good question. And uh, it's one that, uh, it's probably one of the things that's the most exciting part of CentOS Stream is we're really hoping for a robust uh, SIG system. So, uh, there's a special interest groups in CentOS uh, uh, Stream. Uh, it will allow you to take the very stable RHEL base and kind of do whatever weird little crazy or uh, futuristic things that you want to do with it. Um, those things can be proven out over time. Uh, the stuff that gets into the stream main branch, mainline branch, is destined for the next rel release. It is imminent. We we hit pull request when we think it's ready for the next rel release, and so even some of the things that uh, you may want to do, or even we may want to do, that are still several releases out, um, CentOS Stream and a SIG could be a good place for that to incubate. And so if you wanted uh, some sort of ButterFS. Uh, you know, you wanted to add some sort of kernel to it or, you know, whatever you wanted to, whatever content in RHEL you wanted to override, uh, in theory, you could do that in a, in a, a CentOS Stream SIG. And uh, that, is, that is both a fact and a challenge. I think we're, uh, Gunnar, I know you're on this boat too. Like, we're very interested to see what people do with this. And there's already been some very interesting uh, SIGs proposed. Yeah. So to reiterate some of the things that I said in the chat before we started, today we actually had the inaugural meeting of the CentOS Stream Feature Request SIG. And that's a, a new SIG that was approved by the board last month. And its purpose is to take requests from the community and sharpen them and hone them so that we can pass them on to the RHEL engineering team so that they are likely to be accepted. So the corollary to that is that this SIG also exists to be a place where we can say, no, nobody's going to ever accept that. But, but uh, when these requests come in, and one of these discussions happened today in the meeting, some, some folks came with a, with a request and we said, that's not something that the RHEL engineering team is going to accept because they've already said they won't. But we'll also help those folks phrase these requests in a way that will be compelling to that group so that they will accept them. And so it's, it's, it's part of each. Um, so far as ButterFS, that can either be a separate SIG or part of these uh, storage, uh, software defined storage SIG. Um, and there's been a little bit of discussion of that on the uh, CentOS Devel mailing list, but an actual SIG proposal hasn't come out of that yet. 
All right, we have a couple more questions in the uh, question channel here. The, uh, the first one is from Kevin Metcalf, who asks the stability question. Um, we've deployed CentOS 8 in production. These, uh, we update with Yum on a daily basis. What should we know about stability going forward? Yeah, I guess, uh, uh, I don't know. Go ahead. Uh, you Mike, want Mike should answer it. Mike should answer because he's on the hook for it. I guess, yeah, I guess so. Uh, yeah, so um, the, uh, I, I think this is a tough question. This is an easier question to show than it is to, to answer. Like we're going to see over time. CentOS Stream is a very new thing. And it's certainly not our intention to make it buggy or delay it in any way. Um, the, uh, uh, the way to think about it is, um, you know, it's basically our nightly builds. We've been building nightly builds since time immemorial in RHEL. And uh, I think that uh, now we're just doing that in the public and calling it CentOS Stream. Uh, our engineers are not putting things into CentOS Stream until they think it's ready. And so in that regard, uh, a, a RHEL minor release is just a batch of, uh, you know, a, a logical batching of CentOS Stream releases is, is one way to look at it. I think the the other part of that too is to remember that many RHEL customers um, and many even CentOS users, and that will certainly be true of CentOS Stream users, um, they don't just take whatever updates we have and then deploy them with a cron job. Um, you know, a lot of them choose when when to do an update. They'll test it first in uh, in some sort of staging environment or on their in a VM or I guess in your case you've got VMs. Test it in a VM. See if it works, and then deploy from there. And I think that, that that workflow is true no matter you know no matter which operating system you're on. Is it fair to say, Mike, though, that if, if uh, somebody is running Yum Update in a cron job today, um, somebody that somebody is that bold, uh, is it that makes them a pretty good candidate for sent to a stream? Is that true? Yeah, I yeah, it's somebody that can consume things that fast, they'll they'll that wants to do that, then they'll get them even faster with CentOS Stream than before. And I guess that does bring up a good point of uh, CI environment. CentOS Stream is very primed for to integrate with your CI environment, um, even if you're running RHEL, uh, because you'll get to you will find problems the moment that we have introduced them, prior to having to wait until we do some release. Uh, and so that's uh, you know it's another really good uh, use case for it for for those that are using RHEL out there. Christopher asks, will technology previews stay the same or will they live in CentOS Stream only move to RHEL once they're on full support? Yeah, that's a fascinating question. Um, so right now, te uh, technology preview is a set of words that we use uh, to make a very specific claim about what we are shipping in the product itself. So when we say technology preview, we mean, okay, so for this bundle of RHEL, specifically RHEL bits, um, we have, this has a special support status, right? And then the details of that status are usually in the release notes. Um, so this is, a, but the reason why the question is interesting is because, so first of all, to directly answer your question, CentOS Stream has no bearing on technology preview or not, because technology preview is a status that something has inside the RHEL product. Um, but it does bring up an interesting question of, well, now that people have access to stuff before we do something like a technology preview, what we're, what value is there to a technology preview, right? Um, <clears throat> and there's a similar question around, well, what does CentOS Stream mean when we talk about alphas or betas, right? Like what is the meaningful distinction between what CentOS Stream is doing versus what a rel alpha might be or what a rel beta might be or a release candidate might be. Um, and I think uh, uh, there's, a, there's a part of me as somebody who has to read program updates uh, internally to Red Hat, read program updates every day, there's a part of me that would like to collapse all of these things and make them all the same thing. Um, and I regret to inform you though that like CentOS Stream performs a very specific function that is different than what an alpha or a beta or a technology preview might do. Um, and so I think that CentOS Stream actually makes the technology previews probably much more focused, um, probably less open-ended because we have an opportunity to do a lot of that soaking up in CentOS Stream first. Um, so to the extent that people are actually using and exercising a particular feature in CentOS Stream, that's gonna make us much more bold on the when we actually deploy it into the product. 
and either eliminate or shorten the amount of time that we, that a particular feature spends in a technology preview status. And yeah, this is a really good question. We Gunnar and I have done a lot of Q and A's. This is the first time I've seen someone think through that enough because it does make yeah. a lot of sense to to talk about those things too. Yeah. To, uh, you know, to, together. I think the only thing I'd mention about technology preview is sometimes that stuff makes it into rel because we've managed to make it work exactly right for one very specific and loud customer, but it is not ready for anybody else to use. And so we give it the technology preview stamp and then try to fix it later. Just saying, sometimes that's what happens. <laughs> so Grant asks if there's going to be a CentOS 9 stream. And so right today we have two streams going. We have 8 stream, which is currently building up to 8.5. And we have 9 stream, which is out there but kind of doesn't work yet so don't try it yet but is is building towards the initial 9.0 and at any given time we'll have probably one or two streams going depending on which one of the rel development programs is overlapping so the answer to your question is yes there is already a nine stream and i say don't try it but sure go ahead and try it but uh and tell us you know if it works for you, but uh, don't have your hopes too high yet until RHEL 9 comes out in 356 days. That's right. And and this is a, this is an opportunity to kind of reiterate the point. Mike, is there a secret build of RHEL 9 that is actually working internally that people, <laughs> that is different than the one that is in public? There is not. This is, this is yeah. the, the main one. <laughs> <laughs> there, re, there's a rebuild internally, but you can't, uh, you can't tell the difference between them. They're, they're identical. Yeah. Diego asks, um, and I'm I'm kind of munging together several questions here, but he asks about ZFS and uh, why ZFS is not available in CentOS or in RHEL. Um, this is a, a question of of licensing. It's something that that uh, some folks from the community are currently discussing with people on our legal team about about whether we want to ship something with the licensing that ZFS has. And uh, it's still an open question. The answer at the moment is no, but but we're still having that conversation. Do you all have any further insight on that? No, I, I think you've got it. I don't think that we're, yeah. you know, even uh, we, I, I'll say we've had a lot of requests for it, but obviously there's the licensing issue and we'd, you know, we'd, we would prefer to stand by our, uh, uh, our open sourcey code of conduct on that one. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I, I think there's, we don't have any, it's not like we have any moral objections to it or anything. Uh, and if, if the license changes, then, uh, you know, we'll, we'll reevaluate at that time. We certainly don't just support anything and everything just because it happens to be open source. So we may, uh, we, we may still not do it even if the open source question is, is solved, but uh, we're kind of, we have to wait for that to happen before we consider something more seriously, I guess. Yeah. And I think, I think it's safe to say we have not forgotten about ZFS. That is a, that is an evergreen feature request for us and has been for several years. <laughs> Neil asks what a community architect does. Oh my. Um, it, <laughs> I, I, I do what the community asks me to do. I am your advocate to Red Hat and Bex on the other hand, Brian Exelbeard is Red Hat's advocate to the community. And Bex and I are constantly struggling with one another over that that tension between community interests and shareholder interests, and that's that's kind of that tension defines Red Hat in many ways. And so I, I do a lot of you know a lot of marketing type things and newsletters and social media and events and so on. But also I am here to be your advocate to Red Hat. So come to me with your requests. Um, let's see, what else have we got? <laughs> Does Rich and Bex have thumb wars? Uh, yeah, N not, not during the pandemic, but other times, yes. <laughs> so Eric asks kind of a, an insightful question, uh, summary of the questions most frequently asked in these sorts of things. And, uh, you know, for the last six months, we've been answering the question, why did you all do this to us? And uh, it, it's been a it's been a difficult few months, um, 
and and we made a decision that we felt was in the best interests of Red Hat, but we understand that the community found that to be a difficult pill to swallow. Um, and most of the questions have centered around that. Um, and I would really encourage you to um, go to youtube.com slash the Centos project and watch some of the some of the discussions with the board that we've had over the last few months centering on these questions. But uh, if, if you had one specific that you wanted to ask, I, I'm sure that we would be glad to address that. Um, sorry, scrolling through the list here. There's a lot of a lot of chatter going on and I'm not sure which ones are actually questions. Is there anything that you all wanted to uh, address specifically as I look through all of these? I, I could go back and talk about uh, the CentOS stream. There was one thing I, I thought about mentioning on CentOS stream nine. This has actually been an interesting thing to bootstrap because everybody, myself included, have been waiting for a CentOS stream nine uh, and it's there and you can download it. But uh, it's definitely not in a state where we have put it on the downloads page. Uh, because while it is there and ready, it, it's not like ready, ready. And so a lot of people have been wondering, you know, when does the clock start? You know, CentOS Stream 9 is roughly, or CentOS Stream is a five-year-ish uh, life cycle. And so the the, the question is why, uh, you know, when does that timer start? You've released CentOS Stream 9. And the answer is not yet. It will start when CentOS, or when RHEL 9 uh, uh, starts. And so we're in this kind of, weird phase where CentOS Stream 9 is always before RHEL, but it's also so far ahead of RHEL right now that we don't feel comfortable sending an announcement out or anything. Uh, and so, you know, I think uh, uh, Rich is right. You can go look at it and play with it and, and see, you know, some of the main features that we have going into CentOS Stream 9 now. And, and you know, I've certainly got it running in a laptop or on a, on a VM anyway on my laptop, and it's working fine. Uh, but it's going to be a bit before, I would say definitely wait a little bit before you do anything serious with it. Certainly certainly don't put any data on there that you care about at the moment. Let me wait a little bit on that. Grant asks, what has the feedback on systemd resolved been? And do you believe this will be enabled by default in CentOS Stream 9? I don't have any insight on that. Yeah, I... It's been kind of, a, I guess with anything with system D, it's kind of a mixed bag uh, because it's a charged topic. I know some, I will say a lot of people have been asking about whether or not it will be enabled in nine. I'm not actually sure what the answer is to that. I don't know if it's going to be enabled in nine or not. Um, I don't know if anybody has a, a stream nine box up and running right now. They could look and see. Um, I seem to remember seeing a feature on this, but I don't remember if that feature got approved. Like they, we're, we're, I know we were talking about it. And so what I don't know is if it, if it's approved or not. So you just have to check out stream and stay tuned. It'll be in there before it goes in RHEL. And uh, uh, you know, feel free to give feedback if it's not working for you. That's a that's actually a good that's a good, actually a good advertisement for CentOS Stream. So historically, if you wanted to see a new feature in the major release, um, you would file a busy, stay noisy. You would file a support ticket and stay noisy. Uh, you would harass your local Fedora contributor and stay noisy and cross your fingers and hope that the, and you really don't really know until beta drops whether that feature is going to show up or not. Um, one of the nice things uh, about stream is it actually gives you the opportunity to actually see what decisions we are making on an ongoing basis. Um, so it will not be a surprise uh, when, uh, when it comes to 9GA, whether or not uh, we nailed system D resolve. So, so, um, Gunner and Mike, what are you hoping to see appear in a SIG so that the community will deal with it and you don't have to? Oh, I, oh, what a great question. Uh, <laughs> I dispute the premise. So um, I want things in the SIG that I can't even imagine or that, like, you know, Mike has a good size engineering team. I've got a like a set of very smart product managers who are thinking about all the things that we need to do for RHEL. And we have, but nevertheless, we have a necessarily have kind of a narrow view of kind of what it is that we need to do or want to do with the product, right? Um, and that's influenced by customers, it's influenced by partners and ecosystems and things like that. Um, the SIGs are exactly the places where Mike and I, I think would like to be surprised. Um, 
somebody comes up with some wacky new file system that happens to solve the ButterFS versus CFS controversy or something like that, right? Like um, somebody shows up with a, somebody finally solves the window management problem, right? Like that's that's where I would want to see, uh, that's, that, that is the thing that I'm hoping to see in the, in the SIGs is, um, is something new and exciting that never would have occurred to us otherwise. Um, and my second choice, if I had, if I, if I was winning the lottery and I got to choose what I would like to see out of CentOS Stream, the second thing I would like to see is SIG surprising each other. Um, so having a, uh, having a hyperscaler SIG surprise a high performance computing SIG or having a, uh, having a desktop SIG um, do something that would delight the uh, uh, software defined storage SIG. Um, having some kind of cross pollination between the SIGs I think would be really exciting. Yeah, I think I'd add to that, uh, you know, we're, we're already starting to talk about, uh, for those of you that missed it, uh, uh, at Summit this year, we announced that we're getting into uh, even more edge spaces, and particularly with automotive. And uh, I think that that, uh, that use case in the SIGs would be, would be exceedingly interesting. I think I'm also looking for uh, a future where we're in, you know, some of our more sophisticated partners or sophisticated customers, um, get fed up trying to explain to us in English what it is they're talking about and then just can just go show us. Just say, here, this is this thing in the SIG, this is the thing that we're talking about. Because uh, as, as those of you that are uh, engineers know, uh, any verbal language is not quite as powerful as just showing somebody what the heck they're talking about. And so yeah. that's, uh, that's a future where, that I'm really looking forward to where it's just that easy to spin something up, show people what's going on um, and, uh, and take it from there. All right, I'm looking for more questions here. And if you all don't ask questions, I'll keep asking the awkward ones. Um, what what uh, places do you see as the right places for CentOS Stream to be used in the wild? Yeah, that's a great question. I'll, so I'll give one answer and then I'm sure Mike could, because there's several uses. So there's several answers. Um, I think the one where, where my mind goes to right away is say I'm developing an application and ultimately I want to be able, I want uh, my users or my customers to be able to run that application on RHEL. If I care about that application running correctly on the current version of RHEL, it stands to reason that I will also care about that application running smoothly on the next version of RHEL. And this gives me a way of do, you know, plugging it into my CI, like my, Mike mentioned earlier, this gives me a way of testing and anticipating any regressions as I move from one major version to another. Um, and so that that's that's going that's one of the big use cases I know that we're um, that we're thinking about. Mike, do you have another one? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, uh, CI is really where I, I think the, the the most important parts of CentOS Stream are going to live. Um, and I think just beyond that, uh, anybody that's waiting for something in RHEL, like if you've requested a feature or waiting for something to come and you see it pop up in stream, just go and make sure the thing is going to work before we release it. Um, th that to me is the, the most powerful part of, of stream is because so often we have something that is just barely not quite right or doesn't have sane defaults or something, you know, something like that, that we're about to release in the minor. Well, once we release it in the minor, it's very hard to fix or change in yeah. some way. Whereas in stream, like we can turn that around pretty quick within a couple of days, a day, a week. Um, and so that, you know, from, to me, CentOS stream, the, you know, the real power there is going to be in the, the, the real customer's ability to see what's coming very transparently and, and give us basically real time feedback on it, which is something that doesn't exist. And I, not, not very many products have that sort of feedback loop uh, today. And I'm looking forward to that. Another um, one last feedback loop that I'm, that I'm looking forward to. Uh, one of the things that's frustrated me as a as leading a bunch of RHEL product managers is the frequency with which I have to say no to somebody, mm -hmm. even no matter how good their idea is. I have to say, like, can you please include whatever is ZFS? Great example. You know, can I? Can you please include ZFS in, in RHEL? And I have to for a variety of reasons. I have to say no. I'm sorry, I can't help you with ZFS. Not not this release. Um, and it's always a no, and it's just a boolean. Like either it's in rel or it's not in rel. And if I say no, then that person has to wander off and, and find some other platform to go work on. Um, Sent to a stream gives us an opportunity to say not yet uh, instead of no, um, and gives us a place where we can take you know some disruptive new idea. Um, 
like I said, you know, one of these, you know, SIG surprises, right? Um, if you came to a real product manager with some of these ideas, say you have weird ideas about what system D is supposed to do. Um, a real product manager today is obligated by law, by contract, um, to say no to stuff like that, right? Because they have a 13 year life cycle to worry about. They have other customers to worry about, things like that. But CentOS Stream gives us an opportunity to say, try it out, like maybe, like maybe to prove it out, right? Like show us how well it can work. Um, and it really creates, uh, I think I've talked about before about how CentOS Stream creates a lot more surface area for us to collaborate with um, but the community, customers, partners, and things like that. Um, so it becomes, rather than getting a thumbs up or a thumbs down in a bugzilla somewhere, we now have a place where we can actually work out a problem together, which I'm, I, I'm really excited about. So this is a bit of a combination of a question that was asked in the, the question channel and something that somebody has sent me on a, I don't want to make this public channel and uh, kind of mixing several things together. We have a question here that says, will stream nine build routes show up in Fedora Copper soon? I have somebody asking me on the secret channel, <laughs> um, whether we're gonna be building SIG content for Alma and Rocky, um, you know, all of this, all of these questions around the, the multiple points of our ecosystem that sort of all cooperate together and yet are slightly competitive. What's Red Hat's position on these, these rebuilds and also on building stream content in Fedora? I'll take this. I'll take the. Uh, Copa oh, I repo. thought Richard's going to answer the question. I, no, I don't know. Okay. No, go ahead. <laughs> I don't even know if it's a coherent question, but uh, they all feel related. Yeah, I'll, I'll start with the the Fedora Copper uh, question first. I don't know if I, I I have actually been surprised that there haven't already been more integration points between Fedora Copers, Apple, and CentOS, and so there's certainly nothing. I, there's there's no policy preventing it. Um, it's just that every time I bring it up, uh, the infrastructure team seems to think that Copers is not quite what is needed. It's not to say that we don't need to change it or add, you know, maybe add a similar functionality in, in CentOS or Apple or something. Um, but for whatever reason, they have felt that that's not quite, um, not quite the right spot. Uh, as far as Alma or, or other content SIGs, I mean, I guess if the board approves them, uh, then I don't, I don't. I don't see any reason why I would, you know, why Red Hat would put, step in and stop it. Um, there are, you know, there, the the board has some specific rules about where they're allowed to operate, uh, for example. And certainly, if uh, a SIG wanted to pop up and say, well, "I'm going to, you know, we're going to be the rebuilding Rel SIG," um, that's that's going to be a nope. Uh, and part not just because there's what a half a dozen other <laughs> groups out there already doing it, just go join one of them. Uh, so that's uh, that's how I I guess that's how I'd answer that question, Gunnar. I don't know if you have any other thoughts on that. No, that's right. I mean, I think inside that question is the question of like, how do we feel about Alma and Rocky and all these and these other downstream rebuilds that have emerged uh, since the announcement? And the answer is uh, good luck. Like um, we wish them all the luck in the world. Um, just because we don't want to do the work doesn't mean that we're we begrudge anyone else from doing that work, right? And I've been talking with. Um... Jack, who's the, the community manager for Alma, I talk to him a couple times a week and and he's he's very interested in having the communities work together. He sees Cento Stream as Alma's upstream and uh, wants to have a great relationship there. I've had fewer conversations with the Rocky community, but but they seem to be on a on a similar mindset. Um, they see Centos as, as their as their upstream. And so want to maintain good relationships there. So we'll see what happens. All right, Jonathan asks, is there a workstation SIG? And the answer there is, is no, please come make one. Um, yeah. Tell us what that means. Please. Tell us what it is that you want to accomplish. I mean, this is, this is the process for creating a SIG. You have to tell the board, here's what we want to accomplish. Here's what we intend to produce. Here's what's in and out of scope. And here's who, in, who is involved. And so far, almost every SIG that has been proposed to the board, the board has embraced um, and said, yeah, go ahead, do it. And uh, so, you know, we look forward to seeing 
what you mean by workstation sig and uh, making it happen. So please come talk to us on the CentOS develop mailing list and tell us what you mean by that. Yeah, and when I use the CentOS, when I use the uh, the workstation sig as an example, I didn't pull that out of thin air. I've been I've been thinking a lot about a workstation sig. So yes, please. Oh, so <laughs> okay. you're going to start. Uh, I'll have I'll have I'll have people I'll have I'll have, I'll, I'll have my people. <laughs> I didn't know that, Gunner. I didn't know that you were you were thinking about that. It is interesting. Oh yeah, yeah, that's it. right. Well, I'll, in our next one on one, I'll tell you all about it. Okay. All right. Great. <laughs> all right. Could CentOS SIGs get access to Rel itself to build content targeted for it? Yep, and and this is this is in fact very closely related to the previous question about whether SIGs could build against Alma and and Rocky, and in fact, building against Rel kind of mm -hmm. makes more sense in that in that situation. Um, yeah, that's not something that that we've asked the Red Hat liaison to take to to engineer. But what what, what do you all think about that? You're asking us. I <clears throat> well, I know what the answer is. Um, the, the answer from my point of view is yes, and, he, and here's why. <clears throat> After the announcement, we announced the expansion of the Red Hat developer program um, to include all these developer use cases and up to 16, you know, 16 servers in production. You can get access to RHEL kind of free for nothing. Um, we also announced the RHEL for open source infrastructure program, which allows uh, open source projects to use RHEL as a, basically as a build target. Right, um, because we want people to be able to build for RHEL. Um, well, if I put all these things together, um, I've got a way of giving developers access to RHEL for development purposes. Um, I've got a CentOS stream, which would want to build against RHEL. And then I've got ways of giving access to RHEL to the CentOS project itself. All this adds up to, yeah, sure, we should absolutely be able to uh, build against RHEL um, as part of a CentOS thing. Um, now, that's notwithstanding any kind of internal CentOS community rules, but. Um, yeah, I mean, using we encourage RHEL's use in open source projects in general, and then specifically with CentOS Stream. That sounds good. And then logistically, we'd need to work with with CPE, the Community Platform Engineering Group, to actually make that happen. Right. And uh, there's a whole process around, um, you know, CPE and and uh, budgeting their time to make these sorts of things happen. But that's something that that uh, I've actually mentioned to Aoife Maloney, who's who's the our liaison with CPE about making that happen in the next the next quarter. Um, and every quarter they determine their their priorities of what they're going to work on for CentOS and Fedora. And uh, so we have an opportunity to see that happen in the in the next quarter, I think, possibly planning meetings coming up in a couple of weeks. Cool. Um, we have a question from Jeremy who asks, how does the new RHEL license work in practice? Are those 16 licenses per person, department, company? What does it mean? Tremendous question. And it sounds like a veteran of the procurement process is asking this question. So uh, the, <laughs> the, um, the, there is there are two flavors of the rel developer program there is one that is for individuals and then there is one that is for teams not teens teams uh, and the rel for individual subscription includes thanks Mike that was a cheap joke um, the, <laughs> the the one for the, the developer for individuals program which is the one that kind of if you go to the Red Hat developer website that's the one they'll kind of guide you to that's the one that includes the uh, you have 16 servers in production and, and it's explicitly to solve the case of like folks running servers in their basement and stuff like this. Um, the please do not petition for a teen SIG in CentOS stream. That will have that as the wrong. I'm running Minecraft on CentOS stream. <laughs> yeah. Minecraft SIG on the other hand, totally <laughs> inbounds. Okay. So the, but um, so uh, an individual can go get a free, basically free copies of RHEL 16, no cost copies of RHEL for development purposes, et cetera, et cetera, and no support kind of all the things you would expect from a developer program. If you are in a department or if you're in a company that already has a Red Hat contract, you do have access to a Red Hat for, uh, there is a developer for teams offering, which uh, is basically, it gives you RHEL for development purposes, um, but it is in the context of kind of a larger relationship with Red Hat. Um, so that's kind of the, the organizational version of that, uh, that same thing. So they have, they have different rules, even though they're both called the developer, that they're all under the developer program umbrella. 
and, and Gunner, the developer program for teams, uh, yes. not the, the, how many, how many people is that for? Like how many, well, I, th I thought that was like 25,000 people or licenses or something like this. We had to, yeah, because of, because of, because of, for, for, uh, for procurement and legal reasons, you had to pick a number. And so we threw a dart and the number is like 25,000. we like, we can entitle 25,000 systems. Right. And, um, if you happen to be working with more than 25,000 people, I'm sure we can find our way towards increasing that number, but, uh, right. but yeah, 25,000 is the best. So Neil, as usual, likes asking controversial questions. He's got one here. Um, historically, SIGs, and I'm kind of interpolating here, historically, CentOS SIGs have been sort of the upstream version of Red Hat products. And um, how, how are we going to address that to, to draw more community involvement in these? And this has actually been yeah. kind of a, a, a goal of mine for several years to bring on SIGs that were not tied to Red Hat products. Because yeah. to me that, you know, I, I've often said that, that the measure of success of a software product is when it gets used for things that you never imagined. And, and so when I see people wanting to build SIGs around things that are not Red Hat products, that Red Hat totally does not care about, to me, that's a that's an indication that we're doing the right thing in the CentOS project, and so I was particularly excited to see the hyperscale SIG spin up with no Red Hat involvement, no Red Hat members on the SIG, and to me that that is a very positive thing, and was kind of a a, a bright light in the last six months of of awfulness, um, and so I, to me this is this is definitely a goal. I want to see more SIGs that Red Hat doesn't care about. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> that's kind of a yeah. weird way to say that, but that's definitely a goal of mine. Um, yeah, I totally agree with you, Rich. I think that's that, 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 that I share that goal. That's great. Yeah. All right. I am not watching the chat. I'm watching the questions. Um, have you all seen anything scroll by that we need to address here? No, I see somebody signed up to uh, go petition for a KMOD SIG. I see a Workstation SIG has been signed up for. I got, we're, we're building a healthy pipeline of new SIGs here, Rich. So the this KMOD SIG has been has been discussed quite a bit over the past couple of weeks on the CentOS Devel list. And there is a draft proposal that will be presented to the board on this, the board meetings next, next Wednesday. And uh, there is a, a board sponsor for this SIG. Um, which is uh, Pat Rehecki, and who's stood up to to support this this SIG proposal. So that looks like something that is probably going to happen. So if you all are interested in that, come join us on the on the development list and uh, build out that proposal. Um, Grant asks, "What are you most excited about with the future of CentOS Stream and and RHEL and etc." Yeah, for me, I think Gunnar kind of touched on this too, but it's it's the stuff we didn't think of. I mean, you know, we that was one of that's one of the great things about Fedora is that stuff just kind of pops up. And uh, I know there's there's been a lot of talks about what does this mean for Fedora in the future and all that stuff. And, but the fact is, there's with Fedora and RHEL, there was a huge gap in between them. In the case of RHEL seven, it was a five year gap, and it turns out five years is quite a long time in the computing world. Uh, and so I think uh, for me, it's just uh, looking to see what kind of uh, interesting things that uh, uh, that people do that we did not think of. Uh, because then, of course, if it's good and you know, if we like it, then it becomes part of the, the product. We can pull it in the rail at any time. And that's uh, um, uh, I think that'll be a very powerful combination. Yeah. I think for me, the, the, the thing that is most exciting is if I take one step back and look at kind of what the overall rel ecosystem looks like you have fedora and centos stream and rel and even apple um, are all now kind of full-fledged members of the ecosystem they all have kind of clear roles um, there's now no longer some like odd overlaps um, which can be confusing create duplicative work and and just kind of generally not efficient the fact that everything is now kind of very well aligned um, for any given piece of work that you want to do, there's kind of a logical place for that work to happen. Um, I think it's better for us. It's better for the community. Um, and 
and actually touching on Apple, we haven't talked about that yet, but um, one thing going through this exercise is what we've realized is um, Apple is phenomenally important to the success of all of these projects and sent to a stream, uh, RHEL and, and, and even Fedora. And I think the um, uh, one thing that I am very excited about, in addition to ensuring that sent to a stream is enormously successful and has a lot of SIGs and participants and making sure that RHEL continues to be a commercial success and all the rest of it is actually that we can, now I can kind of, now that, now that, we're in sent to a stream world. For me, I can kind of turn my attention to Apple and see like, okay, well, what is, how can we make Apple as successful as possible knowing how popular a project it is? I mean, it's something that frankly, Red Hat has not been paying as much attention to as it probably should have, right? Um, and in the kind of, in the kind of post December 8th world, um, it's now extremely obvious that Apple is essential mm -hmm. kind of yeah. a, a full fledged member of the, of the community. Um, and I would love to start investing in, in it I would love to start investing in it in a way that matches its importance in the ecosystem. I'll put it that way. Yeah. Neil asks, how does CentOS Stream affect the creation of dev preview and the technology preview offerings? I think we, we touched on this a little bit earlier. And I guess one, one thing I would say is that nobody likes the technology preview uh, moniker. And so I don't, nope. uh, you know, it's... Uh, uh, um, I think we generally view that as a failing whenever whenever that happens. Uh, and so I, I don't think it'll necessarily affect the uh, uh, how we do a dev preview or a technology preview, uh, at least at least when it comes to rel. Um, but uh, you know I, I guess it could, you know in, in some worlds it could minimize them as we get more you know soaking time in, in a sig maybe. Uh, yeah. you know that I could I could see some positive influences there, but, we don't. I don't. I don't. Have, I don't think we have any plans on making changes to what does or doesn't become tech preview in RHEL. No, no not specifically. specifically. And if, and to be clear about uh, tech preview is something that every time you see a tech preview come out, you should know that Mike and I both let that go through gritted teeth. Um, <laughs> it's not something we like. Not something we like doing. It's a little bit like holding candy in front of somebody and then saying that they can't have it. Um, and a and a dev preview is a. Um, if somebody can explain to me how a dev preview is different than a technology preview, I would love to hear it because I barely understand it myself. I think dev preview is something, that's a thing that we used to do and I don't think we want to be doing it anymore. It's, it's even better than that, Gunnar. So the, a lot of the engineers picked up on the fact, this is true, they picked up on the fact that the business guys don't like to call things tech preview and so they resurrected dev preview. <laughs> <laughs> and somehow a few of those got through. They're the same thing though. <laughs> <laughs> So Kevin's got a great question here, and I'll just read it in full. Our organization doesn't have any full-time Linux SAs or DevOps folks. We have a lot of auto-patching servers. CentOS used to be ideal for this use case, but it sounds like we need to switch to something else. But we have no budget. Is there a recommended stable replacement now? Yeah, I mean, I, I would recommend first take first and foremost, take a look at the free rel uh, offerings that we have, uh, just because if those do happen to work, then that's just first class rel. There's not like a, we don't do some separate free rel build. It's you know, actual full rel. So if that happens to work for you, great. Um, if not, I'd give CentOS Stream a try. Uh, you can devise whatever lifecycle you want to around that. Maybe, you know, I don't know how often you're updating, but if you slowed that down, that might work. Um, and beyond that, I think, you know, there's uh, a few other options that popped up after the announcement. There were several that existed before then, too. So I think you might, you know, you might just have to look around and figure out what uh, of the of the cornucopia of options that are out there. You might just have to look around a little bit and see which one works best for you. Yeah. yeah. I have no more questions in the queue here. Um, let's see. Oh, here we go. Can you relate the thinking behind repurposing the name CentOS from a downstream of RHEL to a prefix of stream um, for RHEL that is now a downstream of Fedora? And, uh, you know, I, I had a conversation last week with, uh, with um, Greg Kurtzer, who was the person who coined the name CentOS. And he objects to this also, that, that we would choose to use the name CentOS to reflect something that's different from the original intent of it. But branding is hard. Um, 
we we weren't going to call this thing rel um and and my dogs are apparently fighting out back if you can hear that um so i don't i don't know that i have a, a good answer to this um do you all have any insight on why we chose to use this particular branding yeah i'll, I'll take a uh uh, this this has been my take on it, and I think there's uh, certainly not using CentOS was something we discussed. You know that that was a that was an option too. Uh, contrary to popular belief, um, you know this decision was not made to punish the CentOS community or otherwise cause harm. Uh, you know that's not that was was not and is not a goal of any kind with this. Uh, but the fact is, uh, I guess I should say, and the fact is. Uh, we rather like a lot of uh, the people that were in the community already, and they have for a while been looking to be able to do interesting things. Um, we do have uh, uh, some members out there that have wanted, uh, you know, faster, some sort of faster moving CentOS or faster moving RHEL, and we had no answer for that at all, um, and and now we do. And so, you know, for us, we, you know, we knew that this would be, you know, we're not, we're not, uh, we're not that foolish. We knew that this would be a uh, uh, a pretty controversial decision. Uh, having said that, we you know we looked at it and thought that uh, uh, you know building you know it is still you know we're still building an enterprise uh, operating system with this. Um, it is one that is now way more community based uh, than it was before. Um, for anybody that attempted to, for any of you that did attempt to join the the CentOS community, there are very few people out there that were doing uh, QE or you know adding. Uh, uh, kernel builds or, or you know, uh, L repo builds. Uh, and so you know, I, I think that uh, uh, this is a big evolution. Um, and we've done some stuff like that in the past with Fedora. Uh, we, you know, we know that these are pretty uh, disruptive at times. And, uh, uh, but I, I still think that uh, the CentOS, feel, CentOS feels right. And the people that were there were definitely the right people we wanted to stay. Uh, and some of them have and, and are, are going through this journey with us. Some of them haven't. And, you know, we don't, we certainly don't blame them. And, uh, you know, we're just uh, hoping to uh, to push things forward from here. Um, I've, I've been in the, in the community manager position for three years now. And for the first two years of that, one of my big frustrations with the CentOS community was that there was no opportunity for community engagement. And there were a few here and there. But for the most part, when people would come to me and say, I want to do things in the CentOS project, for the most part, I had to say, no, you can't do that because we do all of that inside the Red Hat firewall. And and to me, Santa Stream is a re-engagement with our community. It's, it's going back to what we were able to do before 2014 um, when the community could actually step up and, and work on things. And no, it's not it's not perfect, um, but but we strive to get there. And so I, I really I, I really encourage you all to, to come and and make the community what it can be um and 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 you know really reclaim that that trust that was in the centos name and i understand that 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 some people feel betrayed it's just it, it's frustrating it, it's been a frustrating few months but but we would like to um encourage you all to come and make this your project again all right, we have another another question about the uh, the lifeboats. Um, we I, I'm told that we have a hard stop in eight minutes, like they'll turn this off. So let's move on to this question. What pieces are included in these 16 machines for the RHEL dev program? Is it like server packages and the GUI? Are things still segmented into server versus workstation? If I want Rev VM, do I still use Overt? Um, yep. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, so I'm not going to get the, I'm not going to get the exact manifest, right. But it's basically all of it. It's basically, it's, it's all the rel you could possibly want. Um, and Mike, keep me honest here, but I think as of eight, we actually collapsed all the channels into one. We're no longer differentiating between server workstation bits wise, right. Can you know, yep. we, we, we discriminate on the price of course, and kind of like what's covered by the support policy, but just in terms of the bits, it's all the same bits. So it's like when we say, a, when we say, a a no cost developer subscription. We mean it's like a for real, real subscription. It's not, a, it's not handicapped in any way, right? It's not, it's not limited. Yep. Yep. You got it. And yeah. It's, and, and just to reiterate, there's not, it's not like second class rel or anything. It's, it's all right. There. 
Um, it's just that if you call for support, um, they'll send you to a sales rep instead. So, but the bits yeah. are all the same. Yeah. All right. What can we address in the last six minutes? Um, the, by the, the way, they the won't actually send you to us. Sorry, I should be clear about this. By the way, Mike made a joke about we'll send you to a sales rep and, instead. And actually, we went through acrobatics on the kind of internal Red Hat systems to make sure that those developer subscriptions never end in a into never enter into a lead engine. Like the <laughs> like uh, will, there will be no inside salespeople will call you if you enter the developer program. That is specifically for developers, not for future prospects. So don't be afraid that if you're going to register for this, that somebody's suddenly going to call you, hitting you up for for annual rel subs. That's not going to happen. And, and that's happen. actually been a concern in the community that yeah. that yeah. we don't want to use the free rel because we have to put our name into the into Salesforce at Red Hat somewhere. Right. Yeah, and, well, that's, and, yeah. And, uh, so that's an important important that, that's, point there. That's annoying for me as a Red Hatter. Like I sign up for stuff <laughs> and they try to sell to me. I don't, yeah. I don't think I'm yeah. the target audience. <laughs> <laughs> What is the most frustrating thing about all this from your point of view? Um, I, I'm, I'm going to take this to start with. My most frustrating thing about this is that, that, uh, that you know, to be brutally honest, some of our initial messaging was unclear. And we went out with messaging that people misinterpreted, but that's not on you. That's on, on those of us that wrote it. Um, and, and part of this was due to, to timing, trying to get the message out there as soon as possible. We made a decision and we wanted to tell you about it as soon as possible and not hang on to it. And in that, in that desire to get the message out there, there were some things that were communicated poorly. And, and to me, that is my ongoing frustration that six months afterwards, some of the words that I used in the initial messaging are thrown back at me as proof that we were lying. And that's intensely frustrating to me because, because I know that that's, that's on me. I, I chose particular words and, and now they will haunt me for all eternity. Um, so, so that's my answer to that question. I, I've got a couple. One of them was just, like you say, bad faith actors that kind of show up on lists yeah. and things that are just rooting for us to fail. Um, that doesn't help anyone. Um, I think the other two things I will I will I will flip that question around a little bit and answer it a little bit differently, which is what you know what do I regret? Uh, what regrets have come out of this? I think the big one for me was the ambiguity around CentOS 8's life cycle at launch time. Like we didn't say anything about it, um, and uh, rightfully so, people just assumed it was going to be the same, and I I think I would have thought the same. Uh, and so that that was that was something I definitely think that we could have done better. That's a messaging thing too. Uh, and then the other big one for me was I completely underestimated, or no, I completely overestimated how much people understood what CentOS Stream was at launch. Like it, it got you know I, I had been answering people had been asking questions about it, and I'd I'd been using it as my as my laptop operating system for a year. Uh, but I think uh, when we announced the CentOS uh, uh, end of life message, whatever you want to call it. Um, a lot of people were still very confused about what CentOS stream was and how it behaved. And that was, uh, that was just something that I, I did, I should have anticipated better and did not. It's just that people had not fully absorbed what, what it was as, as an entity. Yeah. <clears throat> I think I, I recognize everything, um, both of my friends said here. I think the, the only thing I would add is, um, in the, in the, with the clarity of hindsight, I now realize that a whole bunch of decisions we've made over the last 15 years, kind of instrumental decisions that, that kind of made local sense. Um, but now with the benefit of hindsight, actually, we realize like, oh, these, these were actually not great decisions. Like these were actually mistakes, right? Like we, we probably should not have done these things. Um, <clears throat> and I don't mean just around kind of CentOS or, or, or how we're engaging with the with the CentOS project. I mean, just kind of overall, you'll see a lot of the things like the developer subscription program. That sh I would love to have seen that in place five years ago, right? Um, but almost as a consequence of helping folks through the CentOS transition, we've spun up 
this ROSI program, the Red Hat for Open Source Infrastructure. We've spun up these developer programs. These are all things that were things that we should have been doing for a long time, uh, and just now we kind of forced ourselves to do them as a result of this uh, as a result of this change in December. So if I had to go back in a time machine, I would take all these. Rich used them. Use the internally we refer to them as the lifeboats. Um, if I could go in a time machine, take all these lifeboats with me and put them in place ten years ago, I think we'd be in a we'd be in a different place. So yeah. But now we're all old and we're in wiser. So we have we have apparently one minute before they're going to turn off the TV here. Um, <laughs> do you all have any any last comments that you'd like to to make to our our audience here? Yeah, I'd, I'd just I'd give CentOS. You know, go take a look at CentOS Stream. We're 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 working very hard on it, trying to do a lot of interesting things there. We would like you to come to come do those things too. It's it's getting a lot of attention right now and, right, and rightfully so. You should come check it out. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, don't be afraid to reach out to folks like Rich um, who, can, who can help you out. And thanks everybody for your curiosity on this topic, right? Um, sitting around and talking about this stuff for an hour is, um, I, it's, I know I would do it. I'm surprised that anybody else wants to do it. So, I mean, this is, this is great. I'm, I'm grateful. Well, thank you all for joining us today. And um, I, I believe that this has been recorded for posterity. So uh, we'll be sending out where that is later. But uh, yeah, and, and Mike says propose a system VSIG. So great. <laughs> 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 all right thank you all and uh have a great evening thanks everyone